All right, we'll go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that on the seed that has been sown, um, that your grace would be at work in our hearts, and especially now as we continue the study of your word, that your grace would be revealed to us, that we may know um, what your word is, your will, and that we would make it also ours. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, so Revelation chapter 14. We're still in the midst of just, I mean, a lot of visions. You just keep saying, then this happened. Then I saw, then I looked, then I heard, whatnot. So we're just still kind of in the midst of a lot of it. Um, try to keep the context in mind. It's hard when we've been reading the way we have to do so. Uh, but we heard about the, remember the dragon and the woman representing Satan and the church. Um, then we heard about this sort of antichrist beast rising up. And remember we talked about the idea of not just a sing, you often hear about the singular antichrist that we're still looking for or whatnot. But we also talked about the idea of the spirit of the antichrist and, and various things rising up uh, to take the place of Christ, imitating him. Um, it's in the midst of all of that that we're going to hear this next bit. We, we even talked about, um, you know, the mark of the beast. But now we're going to hear about the mark of the lamb. So with that, let's just jump right in to chapter 14. Um, let's start with, uh, Mike, can I just start with you here in the front? If you would just read verses 1 through 5, chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like a roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so before we, um, maybe before we comment too much, there's a lot of images in here. A lot of images that ring throughout the old, the whole old and, and into the new. I just want to break down some of these things. So just kind of blurt things out. What are, what are things that stuck out that sort of have meaning or whatnot? So I'll start out actually Mount Zion. What do we think about with Mount Zion? Well, yeah, so that's the, that's the temple Jerusalem. to Jerusalem, right? And there's even sort of the idea, right, that, isn't it the idea that uh, Abraham, when he went to offer Isaac, there's the thought that that's maybe the same. We don't know that for certain. But there's sort of been this theme of God's mountain, mountain theology in general. Again, Isaiah uh, 25, on this mountain, our Lord will prepare a host, uh, prepare a feast, uh, this sort of image of the end time. So Mount Zion big image right there. How many Lutheran churches are named? Yeah. Zion, Lutheran yeah. church, right? Mm -hmm. And with that, okay, the lamb, of which we've heard about in his throne room, and we, yeah, yeah, we've heard about the 144,000. Let's hold off on that. What other images? What other? Written on their foreheads. Yeah, so the, 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 the name written on the foreheads, which sort of contrasts with the mark of the beast we've just heard about. Um, for us, we cannot help but see this even at baptismally. When I uh, bless the children in church, I mention their baptism, and I, tra I trace a cross on their forehead. That's sort of this idea, this invisible cross on us. What else imagery or what else? So these voices, it sounds a little contradictory to me when I was reading this. So uh, mighty, uh, many waters, loud thunder, but then harpists playing on their harps, which sounds contradictory, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of... Just what you're hearing sounds like. Yeah, so kind of, um, that's a great way to put it, Mike, because I would compare this to some of the images we've seen. It looks like a leopard, but it has the feet of a bear and the head of a woman. You know, that doesn't make any sense, but think about the attributes. So, actually, let's talk about this voice. The first thing it said was what? Roar like thunder in many waters. When have we heard a voice sounding like thunder? Transfiguration, baptism, 
maybe not Sinai, it's maybe not specified, but you, you have that kind of the storm that's almost over Mount Sinai. Mountaintop experiences. That's what we're seeing here. In several times in Revelation. Re well, Revelation, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, we might think of the flood with the waters. But then the voice, as Mike pointed out, almost in contrast, it sounds beautiful. Harpists playing on their harps and singing this new song. Um, new song is a thing throughout, especially Revelation. Um, but even, um, again, I'm always reminded of the song they sing after uh, the Exodus. They sing a new song to give thanks for this new salvation they've received. Well, that's sort of what's happening here as well. No one could learn this song except for this 144,000. Again, we'll talk about that number who have been redeemed. That actually reminds me of our gospel reading. What did Jesus tell the disciples? It's been given for you to learn these things. I tell it in parables and the others will not understand it, but to you, and he says it to his disciples, kind of specifically <coughs> his apostles there, but not just the apostles, them to teach certainly, but for, you know, through the Holy Spirit that they would understand. Uh, Dave. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Mount Moriah in mm, yeah. Second Chronicles chapter three. It says, "Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah." Oh, okay. So it, it does specify. Does that it is Thank you. Specifically, that I couldn't remember if it was something that was kind of implied or whatnot. It's hard not to see it, regardless, right? You know. So no, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, but now here in this series, it you know I, I know. Um, this is just my viewpoint, but I think these are 144,000 Jews, not the entire remnant of, right. of Israel that come to faith in Christ during the tribulation, but it's like a look ahead three and a half years later to the end of the great tribulation, and it looks like these 144,000 have survived the great tribulation and are with the Lord Jesus there right. because he won't be on Mount Zion until the end of right. uh, Armageddon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just before we comment more on that, um, as far as imagery again, finally at verse 4, so these are the ones they've been redeemed from the earth. There's no question about that. And, and, and then it specifies, these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, as with these they follow the Lamb wherever he go. They have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits. Now that's key right there, for God in the Lamb. And in their mouth was no lie, for they are blameless. Now, you hear all this, and you're thinking, well, who are these perfect people? And wait a second, so is marriage not, you know, all these sort of like, you're almost challenged to be outraged as you read some of this. To think, well, what does that mean? You know, I mean, is it that we all have to be celibate? Well, no, this is, again, this is imagery. So, you know, when it's talking about defiling themselves, how can we not take this spiritually? Um, and we think of our Lord's parables, the parables of the virgins waiting for the lamb to come into his feast. And then even uh, expanding more broadly, um, you know, what are we as the church called but the bride of Christ? So spiritually, you know, this idea that we remain pure, that we do not adulterate ourselves with false gods, as so often is lament, that's what the whole book of Hosea is, right? Is this idea of adultery. So we are to be undefiled in that sense. Not to say that once you've been defiled, that you cannot be claimed. No, and that's, we would not go so far as to say that, because what really makes us pure, of course, the, the lamb. But through the lamb, covering them, it's then stated that in their mouth there was no lie and they are blameless. They have been redeemed. Uh, you might think of Boaz and uh, um, uh, Ruth with that redemption language especially. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, well, you know, in Paul's letters he talks about the believers as first fruits. So all of us are redeemed in Christ as yes. the first fruits of the land. right. Um, yeah, and, and that's what I was kind of pondering, because kind of even to your idea, you know, is this speaking about some that are already redeemed and not about the whole church? Because you'll hear it talked about the 144, to talk about this number that's a multiple of 12. 12 is the number of the church. Think of the 12 tribes, think of the 12 apostles. So in that way, you could even think about it perhaps being the total number, except for that it's still referring to those on earth. Um, 
how does our Lord talk? Well, actually, it's kind of Paul that we hear specifically. He talks about the Jews being among, you know, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So I think there is this sense that we could talk about through God's people, the Jews, them sort of being the first fruits. And yet we also know, despite that, before our Lord's uh, passion even happens, we know there's Gentiles coming to the Lord. So we don't want to be overly legalistic with that to say it's only Jews. But I think there is a sense of those who have gone before. Either case, the number. Even if I were to say it's not at all literal, even if it's literal, it is still highly symbolic, loaded with meaning. So much so that we should be almost more caught up with that than any number. Not that that does us much good anyway. You hear about this. So what is it? The Which ones? Is that the Jehovah's yeah. with 144? Yeah, we can make fun of that all day. We're not going to. That's not that helpful. Rather, let's look about these attributes of them. Um, and actually, it's helpful to connect it to the next passage. So um, any comments on this so far? though, before I move on. <laughs> Anything else from the images or uh, themes? I forget which one I'm looking at here, but um, if no lie was found. So it's tying it back to chapter 13, where it's the, the fake lamb, right? The second beast is the, is the lamb. Sure, it's yeah. The lamb, but it's an imposter. Uh, and so in their mouth, the lie was found is that they did not believe yeah. the fake yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Lots of contrast here. Like everything. And almost everything, there's contrast. Well, let's go ahead and keep reading then. Um, uh, Carl, actually, if you'll just read 6 and 7, if you would, please. <clears throat> then I saw another angel flying in the air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and fear him alone. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the streams of water. Yeah, so this is interesting. Because you ask yourself, okay, when is this? When is it in relation to what was just stated? Um, so again, it's kind of interesting to look at things historically. Uh, so we talked about... Um, at the time of the Reformation, um, you know, there was serious concern about the papacy being this antichrist in the sense of standing in the place of Christ, that grace was with being withheld, that conditions were being added to uh, receiving atonement in a way that is uh, in place of the gospel. They actually read this. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just sharing. They actually read verses 6 through 7 at Luther's funeral. And the idea is, okay, an angel. What does angel mean besides being a, something with wings? Messenger. And so they actually read this. And so not to say that they were saying Martin Luther fulfilled this prophecy, but yet in what he did that this gospel was being proclaimed and that this was a pivotal moment for all the church in that time for this gospel to ring out clearly. So again, I'm not saying that was a good thing they necessarily chose this reading, but I think the idea of the spirit of this gospel being freely proclaimed, allowing no conditions to be attached to it. Um, you might say this happens throughout church's history, though. We can't help but to try to attach um, outward signs of righteousness. I think we all do it individually, not intentionally. But we all have an idea of what a redeemed Christian should look like, right? You kind of can't. And, we, and what are we told to do? We're told to watch for fruits. You know, we can't see into each other's hearts anyway, right? So you can listen to what people say, but it's not just what they say. Yes, you confess with your mouth and believe. But we also know you can give lip service. Um, you can look at works. We don't ultimately know. Uh, but because of that, there has always been times throughout history where we try to attach conditions to who a, who a redeemed Christian is. And this is not good for us to do at any sort of institutional level. You know, the gospel is unconditional. Grace is unconditional. Uh, and we don't always know people's hearts. But anyway, so I think this idea of this gospel to proclaim to all people, this certainly has been fulfilled throughout. Certainly the New Testament church taking this out. I mean, many 
messengers went out. Many wonderful speakers. Um, but all of this, what was the voice? What did it say? Fear God and give him glory. The hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Dave, please. So, man, what you were talking about, what we look for in a, in a true believer. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all sin, we sin every day, but, you know, in First John it says, um, no one who is born of God practices sin. Yeah. Because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he was born of God. It's not talking about sinless perfection by any means. Right, yeah. We all sin every day, but if a person comes to Christ, it's like if a drunkard comes out of that lifestyle, mm -hmm. that may be a temptation for the rest of his life. Right. But there won't be the practice there. Yeah. There, there's real deliverance in Jesus from those sinful lifestyles yeah. with a homosexual who comes to Christ. Right. They're not a homosexual anymore. Right. And, you know, that may be a real temptation. So right, that identity change. Yeah. There's, there's a real change yeah. in the person. You know, if any man is in Christ, right. he's a new creature. So, you know, and John go on, goes on to say the, the children of the devil and the children of God are obvious. Mm -hmm. No one who practices righteousness is of God. Uh, is of the devil. Yeah, and I, I, of God. yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, and I think that word practice is huge. Practice, habitual, uh, mm -hmm. makes a point of these things. Because, of course, we do that. But what ought to be happening, um, hopefully someone points it out to us. And repentance, right? And it's wrestling. So, because uh, that's always a boy, you read that, you're thinking, oh, am I practicing sin? And again, it kind of comes to how you're defining that word. But if we take it not over literally, but get at the spirit of what it's getting at, it's talking about this idea of continuing it as if it is not a problem, as if it is fine. So to bring up those examples, absolutely. Because, yeah, if nothing else, what do we know as, as, as a child of God? I cannot continue these things. To, to say that I can continue these things with a clean conscience is impossible. I may be doing it out of ignorance. Uh, but to, to think that this is good. So, uh, no question, that's a wonderful passage talking about repentance. Um, so, this the first angel we hear, eternal gospel, all who dwell on earth. But now we hear a second angel and a third, actually. Let's read both of those together. Uh, Diane Conrad, if you would read, please, 8 through um, 11. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen? Fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all drink, nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Another angel, the third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Thank you. Um, so again, these marks... It's kind of just two categories here. Um, you'd like to think there's neutral ground. You'd like to think there are those, you know, as Christians, we believe. And, you know, those people over there, whatever it may be, whatever we kind of define it as. And sometimes we like to think maybe there's, be nice if there's a neutral. I'm not sure there really can be. Because ultimately we need, the, we, need, we need the cross marking our forehead. Um... But this beautiful, verse 8, so the gospel was preached first in 6, and we might say the full gospel. And because of this gospel, what is now a reality, fallen is Babylon the great. Um, even now. But that being said, there's still time in a sense. So those that are still worshiping the beast, 
still a dwelling in Babylon, we might say, uh, as far as their practice. And they, they get to drink this cup of wrath. And that's sort of a symbol we see through the scriptures. Um, but with it, uh, you might be reminded of our Lord um, before his death. What, what does he pray to the Father? You know, if this cup could be taken from me. Is this literally exactly the same cup? No, not exactly. And yet, what do we believe and confess about our Lord in his death? That he drinks, you know, we, would, we could say he drinks this cup of God's wrath against our sin. Now, not the eternal, um, you know, fire, perhaps. So that's where I'd maybe qualify that. But this is, so think about it this way. Our Lord drank that cup for us. And so then when we who are marked, we don't receive that. No, we're counted blameless. But for those who don't receive that mark, even though he drank that cup for them, it will be pressed to their lips. Uh, Cindy, and then I'll come over to Dave. Okay, and on the opposite side, in the 23rd Psalm, uh, yeah, what cup do we get? Yes, the, a good cup. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, you, you can't help but think of wine, but I it mentioned fired sulfur, and I was just thinking of a wine that has too much sulfur in it. I couldn't help but think of that contrast. No, we get the sweet, good wine that our Lord has um, overflowingly poured for us in abundance. This, And so, actually, I mentioned Isaiah 25. I'm like, the way everything connects. Mount Zion on this. Um, we haven't heard about a good cup being brought forward, but you think of Psalm 23 and Isaiah 25 talks about on this mountain, Lord, pre prepare a rich feast of well-aged wine. That's what we're given what do those that have the mark of the beast? The opposite. A cup. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dave, please. Uh, well, you know, if we, if we keep it in the context of the entire book. Sure. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Babylon is talked about in chapter 17 and 18. The, yes. The great harlot. Yeah. Being, and, and the great harlot is a city, a literal city, which I think... John was talking about Rome, mm -hmm. and the, that city is going to be destroyed, it right. says, by right. the Antichrist and his followers. Yeah. Um, and, and, but then with that, though, what I would add to that is, I, I, again, I think there's a sort of the spirit of being, so whether or not you were literally in that city, but carrying the spirit of that city. So... That today, I mean, in a way, we can see Rome, we can see Babylon around us, right? Um, and so that's actually one of um, Luther's writings. I keep bringing to the Reformation. This was a time when a lot of this stuff was being wrestled with. The church was being divided. This was not a thing for them in the West. Uh, he actually he wrote a, a, a letter called The Babylonian Captivity. And so it was perfect. We're talking about Rome. Well... Roman Catholic Church. And what happened with uh, the, the, you know, the Babylonian captivity essentially led in to the, to the Roman Empire coming in. And so the images, the connections were just way too rich. Um, and so he saw this Roman city, that is to say this Roman church led by the spirit of someone who is essentially standing in the place of Christ and his proclamation of forgiveness. He sees a lot of this about that. So that's where this kind of this continued imagery. No question, you're right. What do we see with Rome? It does. I mean, there's there's no doubt uh, the very literal prophecy coming true. Um, and so, yeah, and I think that's even, I didn't have us watch the Bible Project video, but they do kind of a great job of talking about how empires sort of rising up and taking on this uh, new Roman identity in a way, you might say. Uh, we know, you know, we don't put our trust in the, we don't put our trust in earthly princes, ultimately. So any any kingdom is bound to fail apart um, from our Lord's kingdom. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Um, oh, did you? Sorry, Dan. Did you want to? Well, it says he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels. So I always think of fire and sulfur as hell. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. What verse the is that? Sorry. Oh. Um, yeah. That is, no, you're right. That is strange to be in the presence. Um, It'd be like um, the, the father in hell who overcomes. Yeah, so there's sort of that idea. 
Um, I like how you brought it up. It it just it is strange to our ears. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? I've got a few thoughts. If you'd like to, Dave, please. Well, I was just thinking about the whole message here. If anyone worships the beast, you know, the mark of the beast is something that the world has not experienced yet, literally. Sure. That has not happened yet. And this sounds like a warning just preceding the giving of that mark where, you know, we talked about in chapter 13 with the Antichrist giving, being given authority for 42 months to act, right. three and a half years. Right. So just preceding that period of time, this is a warning. Don't get involved with this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, and and there is certainly, um, you know, we think of our Lord Jesus, who who stands as judge, but actually the Lamb. You know, we think of the Father kind of pouring out wrath, and yet we know our Lord Jesus. So, as far as the presence, I'll have to chew on that one some more. Diane, thanks for bringing that up, though. Because, yeah, you think, boy, isn't that supposed to be separate? Isn't that supposed to be, you know, even the idea that you often hear, you know, what is hell, but like the, yeah. the, the lack of the presence of God, the, the emptiness, you know. So, yeah, in that sense, um, I think we could see this as something coming up before. Let's go ahead and keep moving on because that often helps with any of these questions anyway. But thank you. Uh, verse 12. Um, Mark, could I have you read? Would you be able to read? If you would do 12 through uh, 16. During the call for the anointing of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed be you, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds are over. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, and a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Yeah, so some of this harvest language, um, I always kind of get a kick out of, uh, like on Thanksgiving Eve, we sing, come, ye thankful people come, and, you know, it's kind of this happy tune and whatnot, but you get to the last verse that talks about this uh, reaping of the earth and judgment, and you're thinking, oh, Thanksgiving, we're singing about judgment, this is great, we're so thankful, well, and certainly we are thankful to be on the right side of judgment. Um Sorry, let me gather my thoughts. Uh, but, okay, so let's, let's take the plain things. Twelve, very easy to understand. We need endurance. Buck up, Christians. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Endure. Be ready. Our Lord will bless us, but be ready. And then, yes, exactly, very good. Great connection. But, yeah, she mentioned the lamps, the virgins being prepared. But then we hear a voice saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Um, spiritual rest. Um, and all of this, kind of actually back to your point, or your question earlier, Diane. Um, this is still preceding the end, the last day. So uh, as far as the, even thinking back to that fire and sulfur in the presence of the lamb and his angels, um, we certainly see judgment poured out on the earth in various ways. Think of the plagues and the presence of God. Now that wasn't hell, but certainly wrath being poured out. Um, I won't point to a definite time or place or anything, but, but certainly our Lord does not look away from the wrath being poured out. He's not just the loving God who gives you a hug, but also, uh, uh, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But anyway... For the faithful, call to endurance, guess what? We are going to die. But blessed are those who die in the Lord. And especially we know how martyrs are regarded. That, and they will receive rest. So often people ask about, what's eternal life? Where's my loved one? And you get, it's a tender subject when it's, usually when it's brought up. 
So we don't usually address it too fully. But what I tell people is rest. There's a lot of different ideas of things, but we're waiting until the last day. The last day is when the resurrection occurs. That's when we'll be reunited body and soul. Until then, our loved ones are at rest with the Lord. There's not a lot else to be said. But let me be clear, this is a peaceful rest for any who are, this is maybe a sore subject at all for you or a tender subject. Our loved ones are at rest. The end is still coming. And then we're being told about a harvest that is coming. These angels to go out, reap, the hour has come. And then, actually, let's read. I'll come to you in a second, Dave. Let's read the last bit. Uh, Paul, if I can have you read and then finish out the chapter, and then we'll comment. Uh, So, verse 17. Yeah. How long's the stadia? Anyone have that now, right? This is about 184 miles for the total for the whole city. That's what I was thinking. So, a uh, huge amount, huge amount. We don't need to sit there and try to draw it out. Um, wine and blood. Just fascinating. Dave, please go ahead and jump in. Yeah, well, this image of Armageddon is not a new image by any means. No, no, yeah. Isaiah 63, it says, Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his, his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their life blood splattered, or spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Yeah. So it's a very plain picture, maybe more plain than what we're reading here yeah. of the final judgment. Yeah, and this is not good to no. be among these grapes. No, no. Um, again, we talked about our Lord. What does he do? He bears a cup uh, for us, that we would not taste it. What I find interesting here, again, grapes, wine, but then it becomes blood. Our Lord sacrificed for us. What does he do? He bears this judgment himself. And then strangely, especially strangely in contrast to this, we drink this. But it's not, in a sense, we are drinking. Let me word this carefully. (laughs) In a sense, we are drinking the fruit of God's judgment being poured out on our Lord because that means it will not be poured out on us. Our Lord gives this to us. Now, it sounds strange to think that we're drinking of our Lord's judgment, but that's, that's exactly the point. When, you know, what, is our, what does Paul say? Whoever um, eats this bread and drinks this cup proclaims uh, you know, our Lord's death and resurrection until he comes. So, I cannot help but see this as we read this. Now, in this context, it is about those that are not receiving it from our Lord. They will have to go through this then, and they will not rise from it, certainly. And and just the totality. As high as a horse is bright, I mean, that's just great. And, what, 184 miles? I mean, just overwhelming. Uh, you almost think of the Nile being turned to blood sort of thing, right? Just a giant river that thing of blood this is judgment um 
to say all my long, long list of stuff that we still don't have. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, uh, there's always the balance of talking about symbol versus reality with Revelation. Um, this is a reality. Does it look, you know, I would not say it's going to literally look like this in that sense, but will the totality of judgment be this? Yes, certainly. But, you know, you're right. We Again, that's why we drink the blood our Lord poured out for us, that we do not see this or bear this. Um these are two harvests? Well, first think about any of our Lord's parables. What does he do? He always sort of flexes the, the meaning of, of everything. So, you know, in one parable, he'll talk about the wheat and the tares. There's, you don't take out the tares until the wheat's ready to harvest. Here, it's not wheat. It's, 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 it's grapes. But you think about it strange because you think about, but aren't we the vine? Isn't he, isn't he the vine? We're the branches. So aren't we making grapes? But, uh, so yeah, I mean, there is the idea of uh, what was the first harvest that you were referring to? Is that in, um, uh, in 16, oh, 15. 14 and 15. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the sickle, it makes you think of the, of the wheat harvest. So you think of grain, whereas then the second harvest, although it's a sickle again, I guess I can imagine them using sickles in either place. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's a great question to ask. Uh, Dave, if you want to jump in, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's the same thing. Yeah, Diane is talking sure. About. I think it's sure. the same harvest. Yeah, yeah, but but God has provided the only solution. Right. The yeah. Father has poured His wrath out on His Son. Right. So that we could be delivered from that. Yeah. And if we reject that, this, this is, is what, what we're facing. Yep. No question. No question. Totality. Totality here. We've just got a little bit of time, but 15 is really short. So let's just, the more we can keep everything in context, the better. So the more we can cover, the better. Um, Anne, can I jump back to you? If Would you do uh, one through four, please? Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the, of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O God. and true are your works, O who will not fear our Lord and glorify your name, for you will not have all nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been done. I love it. This connection back to the beginning. It's the song of Moses and the Lamb. So, so um, what I was double checking here, it's not. I have a note written back to Exodus 15. This is the song of Moses they sing. It's not literally the same words by any stretch, I don't think. Um, but what's the content of it? Or what's the meaning behind it? So that's, this is how we learn to read the Old Testament. We're being told, go back and read about Moses and their Israelites leaving Egypt, which in some ways is just one of the best images of, of our uh, redemption, of being brought into freedom. Uh, it's hard to, it's such a kind of more of a concept thinking about our Lord's death making us free, but but seeing the Israelites going through the Red Sea and being made free, that's very, very uh, understandable. It's a narrative. And so that's what we're being taught is this is the song really that Moses was getting at with their freedom. And this becomes the song also of the Lamb. It is one. Um, and kind of to the point, uh, Dave, that you brought up, you know, uh, who is the Lord but the one that saves us from this judgment? Um, and, and Him alone. He is good. He is just. He is true. He alone is holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Um, nations there, we might think of it in a couple different ways. We might think of um, different nationalities, certainly. Um, 
in a way, it also is kind of the negative nations. We might think of that, you know, the idea that all every knee shall bow on the last day. There's sort of that idea too. But I think, I think uh, certainly this idea that not just for certainly ethnic Jews, but all people, because of the revelation of his righteous acts being revealed, the, the epiphany, as we see with the uh, with the the wise men. And then let's go ahead and finish out the chapter, and I'll take a few more comments, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, Becky, if you would read verse 5 then to the end. After this I looked, right through the treasure which was in the heaven was open, and out of the sanctuary came seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God. And from his power, no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. We heard about Moses. We're hearing about plagues. Again, it's almost as if we're invited to consider all this in light of the Exodus story. And of course, what makes it's kind of like how we understand everything in the scriptures according to Jesus. When we're trying to interpret all this, we're invited to look at it like Moses. So, you know, in a way, it's very simple. Believe in the one true God, uh, be set free, or be with Pharaoh, be arrogant, harden your hearts, and what will happen? Plagues, judgment, fill in the blank. We're going to hear about these seven bowls and these seven plagues next time. So hold on to that. But Dave, please go ahead. Yeah, I was looking at verse 2 and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire fire in this context I think is talking about persecution on the believers and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass sea of glass perfect peace yeah. in heaven yeah. having come off this horrible experience and I'm thinking about chapter 13. Also, it was allowed, he was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Now, that's from the beast perspective. The right. saints are not conquered. Right. Paul said in Romans, in all these things, we, we overwhelmingly conquer. Yeah. So he loved us even though we were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Yeah, right. We, this is the beautiful picture of having conquered in the presence of our Lord here in heaven, yeah. even though it was out of uh, mingled with fire yeah. and the persecution, and incredible persecution. Absolutely. Victory. Yep. Victory over. Yeah. You know, a call to endurance, but, you know, he who endures will be given the crown of life. Um, survival is not uh, living. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right. Simply staying alive is not enough to conquer. That's not conquering. It's and being faithful even unto death that we conquer. Yeah. And please. Uh, you know, we're reading all this and all this symbolism and whatever. Yeah. But I mean, if you watch the Grammy, I don't know, watch them, but I've seen the exit. <laughs> You see that symbolism, that demonic symbolism. Yeah, I've I've that heard. It's pervasive. Yeah, I've I've heard a lot about that. I didn't watch. Um, the more obvious things are the easiest to avoid in some ways, right? Uh, yeah, I I I I think there's a lot of truth to that. That you see, see some of the symbology of of the other kind, the not good stuff, in society. Absolutely. Um, if anything that. You'll sometimes hear people argue there's no such thing as secularism. And by that they mean the idea of being secular, that is to say not being spiritual at all. They would argue there's a spiritual reality behind everything. And that would kind of get to your point. You know, what what is often promoted at those sort of things? Um, uh, freedom to sin, we might say. And we'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, You put a plug in for Thursday morning in your sermon. Uh, we're going through Chronicles and oh, yeah, the yeah. dedication of Solomon's temple. The presence of the Lord was like a cloud. Yeah. And no one could enter. Right. So it's thick. Right. It's exactly what it's doing. Uses the word smoke here. Right. It's yep. exactly the same. In, in oh, the yeah. Here. Yeah. And, you know, there's a cloud motif, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Presence. I mean, yeah. We were talking about here a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. Just being 
clothed or robed in yeah um, yeah and especially in the context of wrath again for the saints we're good to go yeah. we've sang the song we're with <laughs> moses but this not that the cloud of god always means wrath but it's the, it, this almighty power being present visible but mysterious with smoke but then from this we're going to see these seven bowls of wrath on 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 the unbelievers yeah let's just go ahead and wrap it up here there's always more to chew on there's always more to think about um yeah these motifs these uh these reprises uh and again this is how we learn to read the old testament is to understand that everything that came before obviously literally happened, and yet there was a symbolic reality of what was to come. There was a, maybe a better word than symbol. Symbol always sounds cheap or, uh, I don't know, inauthentic. We might say there was, rather than a, a spiritual, re, or a, rather than a symbolic reality, there was a spiritual reality of everything that happened in the Old Testament. And it, it's the same spiritual reality that we now see clear in our lord jesus that idea of the veil of moses that you hear about has been lifted we can see that this is all pointing towards our lord jesus christ the lamb who is reigning on his throne uh let's close with the lord's prayer kind of like a foreshadowing yeah foreshadowing yeah yeah so you no know, that's that's always a good word too for sure yep um absolutely let us pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Pastor. You bet, you bet.